SRC, Salaries and Remuneration Commission, have been silent as this whole debate has been raging. Silence is not an option anymore, Mr. Speaker. They have to speak to the country. They have to tell us what is it that you're going to do so that we reduce our public expenditure on wages and salaries from 46% to the mandatory 35%, Mr. Speaker. If it means taking a pay cut, we as members of parliament, Mr. Speaker, good people, we have been told that it's not possible that members of parliament will never do it. We don't have an option. We have must do it, Mr. Mr. Speaker. The yearly increment that is now being discussed, that you are being told that uh, I saw that being reported or misreported in sections of the media that we are now going to earn more. SRC continues to be silent about it, but we must make a resolution and say we reject even that one in light of the financial situation. But as it is, Mr. Speaker, as it is, as it is, Mr. Speaker, even if the high earners were to take a shave on their salary, that is still not enough. I don't have the statistics, and that's why I've said some of these constitutional commissions have failed us, uh, Mr. Speaker. I don't know what would be the percentage of Kenyans say that earn over and above 100 and 150. But I'm certain, Mr. Speaker, they are in the slim minority of less than 10%. 90% of our public uh, officers learn, earn less than 100,000 and below, uh, Mr. Speaker. And therefore, whatever savings that we can make there, let us make, but over and above, the thing that people don't like, Mr. Speaker, and we, this featured prominently, Senator um, Omogeni is out, but he knows, this featured prominently in our NADCO talks, and a report that we tabled here, Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, which we haven't done with speed, Mr. Speaker, captured all the wastages that are in the public expenditure space and what we need to do as a country. From page 546 of the NADCO report, I think, to almost uh, page 600, Mr. Speaker. We are things that we can, we understand, we, things are tight. It's the most obvious thing that people do. Young people are telling us when you have a job with uh, Safaricom, you can live in Langata. But the day you lose that job, you move downwards to either to South B or Moja until things get better. That's what we are not able to do as a leadership. We know for a fact that when things were better, we could all fly business as members of parliament. But if you read the recommendation from NADCO, we have said any flight that is less than three to four hours, surely, surely, must you fly business as a public official? Three hours. You will not even sleep. You know? And so many things, Mr. Speaker, recurrent expenditure and wastages. Institutions, even Parliament. And you know, I saw our staff criticize us and say, yes, we have been saying this or the other. But even our staffers, they need to know that this must come to them. You know, I've served as staff welfare chair, so I know a thing or two about expenditure in this institution. You will hardly get anybody in Parliament Mr. Speaker, on a Friday, even to consider a report on something that happened in Parliament, Mr. Speaker, people cannot consider it in Parliament. It must be considered in Naivasha or Mombasa. As is the case in all our public institutions, we must lead by example, uh, Mr. Speaker. And before we exit out of this motion today, we must give a blow-by-blow -blow detail and say, what is it? What happens? Why is it that people cannot think in public offices on Fridays? that there must be somewhere in Naivasha, there must be somewhere in Kisumu, there must be elsewhere, Mr. Speaker. I don't think that there is any correlation between better consideration of a, of a, of a tender document or evaluation exercise that comes when you leave Nairobi, Mr. Speaker. These are extraordinary times, Mr. Speaker. And I must appreciate that there has been guidance, Mr. Speaker, and we are being reminded that because the finance bill has now been sent back via presidential memorandum and all clauses have been deleted. You know, that's a space that many people misunderstand. And sometimes we need to help people also appreciate parliamentary procedures. Number one, finance bill remains to be a bill. It's not an act of parliament. Like many people have seen misreported in public spaces and says, oh, it takes effect on such and such a day. But as a sign of goodwill and trust because 
trust has been completely eroded at this time, Mr. Speaker. I think the worst thing to do is for the National Assembly to come. Uh, the Budget and Finance Committee considers that recommendation immediately, Mr. Speaker, so that people are satisfied that that is behind us. But having done that, of more importance, the National Treasury must table the new budget estimates that captures, Mr. Speaker, the new reality. Less 3.9 trillion, less the 346 that was lost. And people must take a cut. In fact, my proposal, Mr. Speaker, it's a very simple exercise. 346 out of 3.9 trillion budget, Mr. Speaker, is 9%. At least at the national level, because I wouldn't wish that the same be applied to our counties. For counties, it must be on equity basis, Mr. Speaker. But on government, national government institutions, just to a pro rata cut. If your budget was 300 billion, Mr. Speaker, as a state department or an agency, you just do, you submit your new estimates less than 9% so that you are left to go and do the reappropriation of whatever needs to be done. And by next week, Mr. Speaker, we have a new uh, budget that captures that particular reality because, like we are being reminded, living within our means is not an option anymore. And I believe that when our colleagues reconvene in the National Assembly, they'll be guiding us in that particular. But I have to be specific and say, because in the first instance, the distribution to counties was not pro rata. Then the shave, I don't know what is being proposed and we will, we will wish to be reasoned, but it cannot be pro rata to counties, Mr. Speaker. We must, at the very least, I know it's not in my place, but at the very least, Mr. Speaker, counties should not get less than what they got last year. At the very least, Mr. Speaker, I know it's difficult, but somehow, somewhere, we must protect. Though, Members, I don't know if you follow this conversation. Even in our own county level, people have become more critical in budget-making process. And they are beginning to ask our county governors, can you lay out your budget in public so that we see also where is your confidential vote like there was? You know, there are many budget lines that people don't follow. But now people are becoming more alive to reality of the budget-making process in our counties. And we'll speak later i'm sure when colleagues speak they will get time i cannot uh, say everything to say on also the architecture of devolution whether as as is presently moving mr speaker whether it can work you know mr speaker you you are governor between 2013 and 2017 many young people women and the vulnerable <laughs> made a life out of doing business with counties and there was spread of resources within you know, in every village, you could see a young person and you'd be told so and so. He's a road contractor. He supplies this and the other. He trades with the county. And therefore, people could begin to appreciate. These are things that were completely unknown to the country before the promulgation of a new constitution. Post-2017, there are no such people in our villages, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I have said on the floor of this house many times that unless the governor is your personal friend, or sometimes even unless he's your father, nobody can dare supply to our counties anymore. Nobody can dare trade with them. As protectors and custodians of devolution, Mr. Speaker, the House charged with the responsibility to make sure that devolution works in our county. Before we exit this motion, we must propose a way forward. If it means forcing our governors to first clear all the pending bills that have been found to be uh, uh, eligible, Mr. Speaker, before rolling out any new development so that you give life at least to the many women and young people, Mr. Speaker, that have lost whatever little savings they, that they had by trading with counties, Mr. Speaker, we must pass that particular resolution uh, today, Mr. Speaker. On the issue of police, I just want to speak to two final issues, then I conclude. I once said in a public forum, I was asking, where is the IG? That was in relation to the killings that were going on in uh, Kerio Valley. It's been two weeks of protests, Mr. Speaker. Kenyans have lost their lives. Others have been beaten. There have been challenges. Police have faced also very difficult and uh, hostile uh, gangs on the streets. I am yet to hear the voice of the Inspector General. I am deeply troubled by that, Mr. Speaker. It cannot be right. 
We were in this country. Though I was not a leader and I was a young person in university, Mr. Speaker, when we faced the post-election violence, day by day, General Hussein Mohammed will brief the country and speak to the country and give them an update of what is happening. How can we face such a crisis, Mr. Speaker? Up to this particular point, I don't know what the Inspector General thinks. I don't know what is the challenge. We don't know these things that are being discussed. Mr. Speaker, the question at the back of my mind, is this really the right man for this job? Mr. Speaker, we must think critically, finally, about Article 37. We have had conversations and debates here on this House. Were the demonstrations peaceful or not? How is it that we continue to struggle as a country with this thing of peaceful demonstrations? What is it that we are supposed to do? Can't we guide and provide the way forward so that people can know that if I want to peacefully demonstrate as expected of me under rights guaranteed under my constitution, what is it that we are supposed to do? Because a new trend is emerging, and we have seen this, Mr. Speaker, where any time when you organize a demonstration, Infiltration and separating between those that are peacefully protesting, Mr. Speaker, and those that want to take advantage of the environment and the climate that has been created is difficult to distinguish. And I'd wish to request the House that we don't exit on this motion until first we provide the way forward and guidance. I listened, for example, Mr. Speaker, to one gentleman, one of the organizers of the Occupy Parliament a crusade, and he said, According to them, they just wanted to come and sit outside here and listen and make noise as the debate on the finance bill was ongoing. And I said, okay, fair enough. But unfortunately, in the way that they communicated, it was impossible to tell how to do that kind of an occupation. I wish, Mr. Speaker, at that point, that there had been an engagement either with your office because... You are the person who permits uh, this kind of engagements so that we know how is it that if today there are 100,000 people who want to come and present a public petition to parliament, we should be able to facilitate it so that they know what time they'll come, how, what they want to do, so that we set the rules and agree and people know and we don't provide an environment or a climate that is right for people with sinister motives, Mr. Speaker. I know for a fact that it was not the design of the young people that wanted to protest outside parliament for parliament to look like it, it looks this afternoon. They had no intention of burning anything. I don't think it was in their design to destroy the amount of property that has been destroyed here. I don't think it was in their design, uh, Mr. Speaker, for members to flee for their life. They wanted to come and present a petition. Therefore, we have to think and propose as a way forward of how is it that we can guarantee every citizen how we protect their rights because there are two inherent dangers, Mr. Speaker. If we don't provide a way forward and a way out of this particular conversation, then it shall be known forever, Mr. Speaker, that it is impossible to have a peaceful protest in this country, yet other countries have it. When we travel, even... Anyway, I don't want to get into a diplomatic challenge by mentioning various countries, Mr. Speaker, but there are countries that you think even are less democratic, but they have provided the space and the means for people to exercise their democratic right on the right to peaceful protest, Mr. Speaker. And it's provided for, and people make their voice heard. I don't know how we can do it. I know colleague members can guide us on how this is done, but the long and short of this conversation, Mr. Speaker, is that we are sick and the ordinary medicine that we have administered over the years is not likely to heal us. We need new medication, Mr. Speaker. Therefore, with those many remarks, Mr. Speaker, I beg to move and request the leader of minority, Senator Justice Retired Stewart Mazayo, to second this motion, Mr. Speaker, and lead the country towards the right 